Okay, so hey guys, and welcome to the next part in the F4 Manager Minority Manager career mode, where we're at the, oh, I was going to say the halfway point in the season, not quite, um, but we're getting near the halfway mark of the season, and we've got the French Grand Prix coming up very soon in two weeks' time, and as per usual, we've got to shuffle through all of the news between now and then, so let's see what, I'm sure, amazing news there is. Right, and right off the bat, we've got some we've got some confirmations here. Now, Olivier Panis, there's been talks about him all the way through the last episode. Will he join Stuart? And Stuart have confirmed him as their driver too. Which means Mika Salo's going. Which is sli a slightly odd call. But then again, we've seen Olivier Panis. He's got experience with... McLaren, he's been their test driver this series. Maybe that's why, maybe, I don't know, but... Although, having said that, Olivier Panis must be around the same price, if not cheaper, than Salo is, so... It might be a cost-cutting exercise, I don't know. We'll have to see what happens to Salo, our beloved Mika Salo. We'll have to see what happens to him. But also, Stuart confirmed Luciano Berti. So, again, uh, Luciano Berti will be their test driver... Yeah, it says he'll be joining, but as you can see from the picture, he was originally at Stewart as their test driver. Um, so that means we know how Stewart's going to line up next year. Um, they're going to have B uh, Luciano Berti, Olivier Panis, and I'm pretty certain they confirm that Damon Hill will be staying with the team next year. So that's actually a really strong driver lineup, I'm not going to lie. Okay, so we got Nick Heidfeld is rumoured to be going to Sauber, most likely as a test driver role because even though Nick Heidfeld has constantly been the most highly rated test driver never has been able to get a race seat I'm surprised Sauber I mean he could I don't know Sauber should take him on as a race driver to be honest I mean I we all know Heidfeld would eventually race for Sauber many years in the future but still I mean I don't know why Sauber, Sauber should take this opportunity to finally pluck the talent that is Nick Heidfeld because no one's no one's given him a race seat which I'm surprised because he's shown a lot of talent clearly um, but Stuart confirmed Matthew Stry uh, Stibe? Stib Stibbe? they confirmed Matthew as their commercial manager now if you've never recognised this picture before I'm guessing he's an EA employee in fact I know he's an EA employee because well A I've never seen this guy before in my life and B, Stuart are only paying him ten grand a year, uh, ten thousand dollars a year. So this is the first time we're seeing an EA employee in Formula One. I mean, not aside from the driver role. Obviously, we've seen Neil McEwen and Owen Green, but this is the first time we're seeing, as part of the operations management, part of the behind the scenes. Management, so I don't know why Stuart have done this. Maybe again, it's cost cutting, like I've already speculated with Olivier Panis, but this is really, really weird. So, Stuart's commercial brains are now going to be a former EA employees. Okay, and Neil Oatley has designed us some new barge boards, so let's get on to manufacturing them because again, Neil Oatley working just relentlessly just does not stop designing new parts. It's but, I mean, I guess that means we've got an aero upgrade in time for this race. We're assuming we manufacture enough of them in time. Um, so, yeah, things are looking good for the French Grand Prix already. Right, we got some more confirmations. So, Prost confirmed Thomas Enger as their test driver. So, again, Thomas Enger's been one of these people in this series who's been moving around, testing for different teams. But now he's going to be at Prost uh, testing their car next year. And we've also got Prost confirm Craig Tanswell. I guess he's an AA employee as well. Yeah, he is. Well, Prost are clearly going through some financial difficulties because they got Thomas Enger for a very cheap salary. And now they're getting Craig Tanswell as their technical director. Now, that's astonishing. So, Prost are risking, and I mean this because it's a very big risk, they're risking an EA employee as their technical director. And that's a very big and important role, a technical director, and risking it to an unknown EA employee. 
that's a big deal. I mean, Prost, just on this signing alone, the Prost could be absolutely nowhere, dead in the water next year. Oh, and on the other end of the scale, Williams have confirmed Rory Brin as their chief designer. So, there you go, he's been moving around from team to team, he's been at Ferrari, he's at Ferrari currently, and he's been to Jordan, and now he's going to Williams next year, so keeps on moving around, he can't settle the place, but with Williams having the joint best chief designer, Williams are looking very, very strong next year, very. Jeez, we've got so many confirmations. BAR have confirmed Stephen Watson as their driver number two. Now, Stephen Watson, who's currently the Williams driver number two, or is he driver number one? Actually, I think he's, yeah, no, he's Williams driver number one, isn't he? Because Ralph Schumacher's always been the driver number two. Well, it doesn't matter, he's now getting arguably a downgrade because it's the driver number two, but BAR, we've seen this series so far, are the third quickest team, they're second in the Constructors Championship, so if BAR um, are able to maintain that pace next year, we could see Stephen Watson maybe on the edge of the championship hunt. Okay, so we got another confirmation, wow, I forgot how many confirmations you get in the mid-season, but Sauber confirmed Gary Anderson as their technical director, so finally, even though Prost have confirmed an EA employee as their technical director, at least Sauber, while a relatively boring team and haven't done anything amazing so far this series, at least they've been able to sign a good solid technical director and so clearly aren't struggling financially which is good to see. Right we got some more confirmations here, BAR confirms James Hawkins, or as their test driver I guess that's a relief to see. So James Hawkins he was rumoured with the drive for Ferrari. Uh, Way back at the end of 99, he was rumoured, but then it was Neil McEwen who got the role in the end. But James Hawkins has finally got his driving career off the ground. So James Hawkins, EA employee now, well, next year will be the test driver for BAR, which is a phenomenal sight to see. And Benetton, along a similar vein, Benetton have confirmed our role test driver, Owen Green, and... I don't know how so many EA employees have got confirmations this episode, but we've seen technical director, commercial manager and test driver roles all given out to EA employees. I don't know what's going on in the Formula 1 world, I really don't. Another confirmation, so McLaren confirms Rob Armstrong as their commercial manager, so again, we're seeing another sensible signing. For, for McLaren you would expect maybe a better commercial manager but still it's good to see that McLaren, the mighty McLaren, don't have to stoop down to getting EA employees. At least McLaren can sign people who are experienced in Formula 1. That's a good sign at least so I never thought I'd be so happy to see McLaren sign someone so mediocre but in the wake of all these EA employees getting roles, this is an exceptional signing. Right, so hopefully this will be the final confirmation for this episode. Statement from McLaren. Again, they're retaining the services of Mike Coughlin as their technical director. And Mike Coughlin, if I remember correctly, he's been at the team for a while this series. And he's going to be with them for a further year, so... At least Mike Coughlin's clearly he's clearly doing something right because he's proving his worth to the mighty McLaren and McLaren are well at least Jack Villeneuve is relatively on the pace this series so clearly he's doing something right to to drag McLaren through their seasons despite having poor engine supplies and etc. And so finally that's the end of the confirmations. Wow, I was I was getting worried. I thought. At this rate, the the rest of the signings were going to be EA employees. I was really getting worried, actually. But, uh, but yeah, the next race, France, Magni Corps. We missed a test day at Magni Corps, which the other teams may well have gone to, so that could put us at a disadvantage. But I don't think that's going to matter, because Magni Corps hasn't really been that interesting of a race this series. 
The only noteworthy thing it's ever had is qualifying has always been quite weird. Fizzy Keller, back in 99, drove out of his skin in qualifying, and that's only because he was confirmed to be at McLaren next year, so his morale was at an all-time high, and he just put in an astonishing lap. And along a similar line, this track was the first track that we set a risk-everything lap time in qualifying. That was thanks to Luca Badoa, or was it? I'm trying to remember now, we either did set a risk everything lap or nearly. If I can remember correctly, I think Luca Padoa either did set a risk everything lap or he spun off a couple of corners before the end. No! Oh, Padoa! You were right near the end, you were going to do a lap on risk everything. It was one or the other, but generally this track's been interesting in qualifying dead boring in the race, so I'm looking forward to some fantastic qualifying results, so let's go to it. Okay, now this, never mind interesting qualifying results, these are the practice results. There's some, wow, there's some shockers in here. Hakkinen leading it, that's not that much of a shock. Jacques Villeneuve in second place. Now, we know the McLaren car this year isn't that great, but Jacques Villeneuve, as some people have pointed out to me in the comments, Jacques Villeneuve has been a driver this series who's been able to drag the McLaren out of bad situations. He's been a guy who's made the most of bad cars. Second place, that's exceptional, and not too far off of Hakkinen. And he's ahead of Coulthard, who's down in fourth, so is Lamarie, who's in third. I think the most interesting result is Pedro Diniz in 5th. Now, I think this is along a similar line of Fizzy Keller back in 99, because Fizzy Keller had an exceptional qualifying result after he was announced to go to McLaren for the following year. And I think Pedro Diniz, because he's at Sauber, a pretty low-life team, and last episode he was announced to go to Jordan. So that's an upgrade, definitely, from a Sauber. And I think it's that morale boost and that excitement of going to Jordan next year. That means Pedro Diniz has pulled off a stunning performance. I don't know why he can't do that all year round, but that's an exceptional performance for Pedro Diniz. Another exceptional performance is Heinzel Frentzen in 7th place. Now, we know Frentzen this season hasn't been that great in practice, but... And you may think 7th place isn't that great. It's behind both BARs and McLaren and the Sauber, but... Frenson's in 7th, his teammate, the great Michael Schumacher, is down in 13th. I mean, if you look, Schumacher's been beaten by Sarazan, former Minardi driver, both Williams, including his brother. I believe this is one of the few times this series we've actually seen his brother beat him. So, this has been phenomenal. And in fact, Michael was damn nearly beaten by his ex-teammate Eddie Irvine. They're moving further down the list. Jean Alesi in 15th place for the Arrows is phenomenal. And then you've got Zanardi putting a relatively decent practice result, not going to lie. Um, De La Rosa putting in a shocker of a practice result. I mean, we know that Jordan's got the second best chassis in the grid and he's down in 18th. But then again, both Stewarts of Damon Hill and Mika Salo, 19th and 20th. What on earth has happened to Stewart? So, if these exact results come up in qualifying, then we could have a very interesting race on our hands. So, Magni Corps, over the years, has been known to produce some very interesting qualifying results, and it produced some exceptional practice results. And it's done the same thing in qualifying, there are some very interesting qualifying results, so let's go through them. Firstly, we have to examine the sheer Minardi domination here in France. Mika Hakkinen taking pole position 1.1 seconds ahead of his teammate David Coulthard, who's in second place. But what's interesting is that both guys did 1 minute 15s or 1 minute 16 lap times. The guy in third couldn't even do a sub 1 minute 21 lap. So, Minardi Mercedes are leaps and bounds ahead of the competition, and it's going to be an easy victory for both of those guys, as long as both guys don't retire. 
In third place is Jacques Villeneuve, and Jacques Villeneuve has slowly gained this reputation of making the most of a bad car, and the McLaren this year is by no means a good car, but to line it up in third place is phenomenal. Especially as he's just ahead of the young superstar Patrick Lamarie in the BAR, who's in fourth. Finally, you got Ralph Schumacher and Stephen Watson, who take up the third row of the grid for the Williams team. In seventh place, it's the Benetton of Ruins Barrichello, with Michael Schumacher, who was able to take pole position at every race last year, couldn't have come close to that as he's down in eighth. Pedro Diniz, who was phenomenal in practice, is down in ninth in qualifying. Fisichello is away off his teammate Lamarie as he's down in tenth, with Sarazan in eleventh. Frentzen, unlike in practice, is behind his teammate, and Frentzen's disappointing season carries on. Although Frentzen is ahead of his former team, Jordan, albeit only just as De La Rosa is in 13th and Trulli's 14th. Stewart are struggling big time here at Magni Corps, and Mika Salo qualifying at 15th isn't that bad considering where we saw him in practice. Eddie Irvine lining up in 16th place creates a 13 position gap between him and his teammate, which tells you to no end the difference between the teammates. Olivier Panis is in 17th, with Verts down in 18th, way off of his teammate who's clearly riding high, knowing he's going to Jordan next year. The 1996 world champion Damon Hill lines up in 19th place, which is even several positions behind his teammates. Both arrows predictably line up near the back of the grid with Jean Alesi 20th and Marc Genet 21st, but impressively for both of them, they line up ahead of Zanardi, and Zanardi's dreadful Formula 1 campaign since 1999 carries on here as he lines up at the back of the grid, three temps off of Genet's lap time in the arrows. So hey guys, and here we are on the race strategy screen for the French Grand Prix, and what a phenomenal qualifying session that was, honestly. I mean, Jacques Villeneuve to get third place. And you've got to realise how good of a performance that is for Jacques Villeneuve. Because McLaren are only using Ford ZTEC engines, which, so that means they're outpowered by everyone apart from Arrows. And it's just an exceptional performance. McLaren haven't even got an amazing chassis like they had the past two years, so they can't even ride off of that. So, for Villeneuve to get third place is outstanding, and Eddie Irvine, who's by no means a slouch, to be down 16th, that, that tells you... that tells you everything you need to know about Jacques Villeneuve this series. I'd say, honestly, maybe Jacques Villeneuve, I'd say, is quickly, in my eyes, becoming the most underrated driver this series. Just, just from his performances, this season and a couple of uh, the performances in the past couple of years, he's done phenomenally well. Michael Schumacher down in eighth. What on earth happened there for a guy who got pole position at every race last year and in a Ferrari to be down in eighth? No excuse for that, absolutely no excuse. But then again, Frenson in 12th. Honestly, I don't know what's going on with Ferrari, but. I don't think we've got to worry too much about them because look at look at the domination from Minardi. Look at that. We're so far ahead of everyone else. Hakkinen's 1.1 seconds ahead of his teammate, and then Coulthard's four seconds ahead of Villeneuve. We we're gonna run away with this race. Absolutely run away with it. If Coulthard's four seconds a lap faster than everyone else, and Hakkinen's five seconds a lap faster, well, this should be a dominant performance for us. We'll probably put our guys on ease off. And we'll still easily win. But anyway, what if both of our guys mess up the start? There's always a possibility. And when is it going to start? Go, go, go. There you go. And Hacken, it looks like he's maintained first place. That's Schumacher. Look, he's in amongst Benetton's, Sauber's, BAR's, whoever. Well, BAR have been good this year. But, look, I mean, look. You don't see red cars in the middle of the field all that often. You really don't. And it says Schumacher's in 19th, again, the typical race position glitch. Now look how quickly the cars go on this hairpin, wow. That's 
that's something that's always stunned me. How quickly the cars go around that hairpin in this game. But anyway, uh, yeah, we're clearly ahead of everyone else. There's Hackenden. He's already, in fact, actually, Hackenden's pulled out a bigger gap over Coulthard than Coulthard has over Villeneuve, actually, so. But then again, Coulthard, for Coulthard to win the teammate battle over Hackenden was always going to be a tall order. And it's just not going to happen. I mean, Hackenden, two times world champion. And he's in the best car on the grid. Coulthard's. Coulthard would have to drive out of his skin to get even close to Hackenden, because we know how quick Hackenden is, and Coulthard is mediocre, shall we say, as a driver. Mediocre about that, but you know, he's by no means on the same level of talent as Hackenden. And our guys have already done the first lap. Jesus, probably because we spent so much time looking at the arrows. There's Lamarie in fifth place. Did he qualify in fourth? He's been jumped by a Williams. That's a Williams in front of him. So is that Schumacher or Watson? Uh, that is Ralph Schumacher who's jumped Lamarie there. This might be the first race this year that Williams actually do well. I mean, this this uh, this year Williams have been nowhere in terms of pace. Last year they were very good, or at least uh, Ralph Schumacher was. Takaki wasn't, but Ralph Schumacher was. But this year, they haven't really been anywhere. I think all they've really had to their name is reliability. Someone who hasn't got that to their name is Frentzen, because, why? Well, another retirement. I'm mean, sure this one's a driver error, but... How many races has Frentzen finished this year so far? About two. I mean, one or two, honestly. Like, Frentzen's not a bad driver. I don't think I need to reiterate that. Frentzen is not a bad driver, but... How come he just cannot finish a race? I mean, this is purely his fault, but still. I do not know what's going on. This is the biggest mystery to me, is what's going on with Frentzen. Fizzy Keller's out of a driver error, so we've got another fairly decent driver going out of a driver error. Uh, meanwhile, our guys have lapped everyone on the field twice, apart from Villeneuve. Actually, Villeneuve is definitely holding his own in this race. I mean, Raul Schumacher is nowhere near him. And in fact, Villeneuve isn't that far off of Coulthard. Actually, Villeneuve is closer to Coulthard than Coulthard is to Hakkinen. So that that tells you something. Villeneuve, I never really thought about how good of a driver Villeneuve was. But then I saw a couple of people comment it to me saying Villeneuve has been a great driver this series. And I thought about it and I'm like, actually, he really is. I'd say Villeneuve. Honestly, I, I would maybe say Villeneuve, driver of the series. Look, he's just got past Coulthard. Or oh, that might have been a pit stop thing. I think it was. Zanardi's out of a driver error. No surprise there. But, I mean, Zanardi... I mean, on the other end of the scale, I'd say Zanardi's been the most disappointing driver this entire series. Shocking in 99. Shocking in 2000. Shocking in 2001. I mean, th those drivers are other ends of the scale stuff. Uh, Schumacher of a suspension failure. It's happened again. It's happened again. Let's... We replaced the parts at the start of this race. We honestly, genuinely did. I put brand new parts on both of the cars. How come Coulthard's had a bargeable failure then? That's... That's absurd. Absolutely absurd. Let my rear have an engine failure. Okay, fine, whatever, but... Coulthard out of another retirement. He's almost as unlucky as Frentzen. And that's the new barge boards. Literally, the new ones that Neil Oatley designed days ago. That's those very new and ones I said were fantastic. And they failed. Honestly, something's going on. I don't know whether it's Neil Oatley. I don't know whether it's Ross Braun. But this is getting out of hand. Seven races in and we still can't get our reliability in order. But then again, on, you look on the plus side, I guess, that means De La Rosa is now in the points. So, they go, in fact, actually, if another person retires, then this could be in the points. Do you know what? In all honesty, I wouldn't mind that much if Hakkinen retired, if it meant Diniz got some points. I honestly wouldn't, because Diniz, this, this Grand Prix, 
Diniz has been out of this world. In fact, he is in the points because Stephen Watson's out with a bargeable failure. So that's two bargeable failures this race. So Diniz, Pedro Diniz, a driver who's done nothing this series, has been the most boring standard driver this series, is in the points. And rightly so, after the performances he's had in qualifying and in practice especially, definitely deserves it. But anyway, Mick Ackerman, dominant drive. Even even Coulthard couldn't stay close to him. But then again, Coulthard clearly had a faulty barge board. So, you've got to factor that. Coulthard had a faulty barge board. And on that fact alone, he could have been a few tenths of a second. Or a few tenths of a second a lap slower. Did that come out right as a sentence? Anyway, Hakkinen, he's being held up by this Jordan. I don't know what's going on, but Hakkinen's going to cross the line to win the 2001 French Grand Prix. And that Jordan, jeez, that Jordan was being over-aggressive with its defending then. Jeez, which Jordan was that? That was uh, number seven. So that's, um... Trulli. Oh, well, it's maybe, maybe it's because Trulli's disappointed he didn't get the Minardi seat. But then again, Trulli signed for Williams... That's his that's his mistake. We tried to get him. But anyway, let's just skip to the end of the race. Villeneuve, so far ahead of the rest of the field. Villeneuve, second place, thoroughly deserved. I mean, finished two minutes ahead of Ralph Schumacher in third. And in fact, Ralph Schumacher, that's the first time this season we've seen Ralph Schumacher get a decent result. He was getting all sorts of podium finishes back in 2000. Absolutely nothing this year, but he's got a podium finish, and Ralf Schumacher, he definitely deserves it. So, it's good to see that Ralf Schumacher and Williams, and Supertech, of course, because Supertech seemed to be the weak link for that team. We saw it last year and this year, but it's good to see that Ralf Schumacher, Williams, and Supertech have got their act together. Ralf Schumacher's got a podium. Barrichello in the Benetton's fourth, De La Rosa fifth, but the main story, I feel, Pedro Diniz... In the Sauber, going to Jordan next year, Pedro Diniz finished 6th at this Grand Prix. He's ahead of a former world champion in the Stewart. Honestly, Pedro Diniz's performance this Grand Prix, out of this world. I mean, look, Vert is down in 10th. Honestly, just wow. There you go. Maybe I should, I should have signed Pedro Diniz now, maybe. Maybe I should have signed Diniz, but... I mean, Diniz only works on a morale boost. He only works when he's high in morale in the same way that Fizikello only ever seems to. And a prop, maybe Frenson for that matter. I don't know what's happening with Frenson. But anyway, Minardi win at France, Magdi Cor. Um, everyone's happy. Well, apart. I'm happy for Diniz. I'll tell you what, I'm not happy with Neil Oatley or Ross Braun. Because they can't build. What's wrong with Coulthard's car, honestly? Ross Braun, what's his take on it? He, I'll tell you what, he should send me an email saying, sorry I built or fitted the barge board badly. No apology. No apology. Best regards. You know what, Ross Braun? I love you in real life, F1. I honestly love you. Hold you in the highest regard, but you can go do one, because either you or Neil Oatley, but Neil Oatley was proven to be phenomenal last year. You've proven nothing. Got a ton of money though, 3 million prize money, that could have been 4.8 if Coulthard was able to get second place. And then Neil Oatley, is he going to apologise for designing a faulty barge board? No, but according to him, we've got the best everything, apart from suspensions and side pods, which BAR do. So, there you go, we're lacking in the suspension side pod department, but Neil Oatley says he's doing a good job. It's either him or Ross Braun, honestly. It's one of those two, because something's going on there. And I would suspect Ross Braun, but there you go. Anyway, we're in July. Ooh, we're properly into the summer months now. And, well, that's why we're going to the British Grand Prix. Jeez, you can't go to the British Grand Prix. Not during the summer months. They'd be tipping it down. Um, it could, well, I could easily tip it down in July, to be honest, knowing Britain. But anyway, the British Grand Prix. We've done relatively well here. In the past, Minardi. Um, especially in qualifying. Actually, maybe it was Silverstone where we set our first ever risk everything qualifying lap. 
it might have been Silverstone actually. Um, but yeah, Drivers Championship. Hackenden's pulling away from this. I mean, Schumacher didn't score any points, so there you go. I mean, Coulthard could have been ahead of Schumacher if he didn't retire. Constructors way ahead of everyone. Way ahead. Uh, yeah, McLaren fourth in the constructors. You wouldn't have thought that if you look at the specs of their car. You wouldn't have thought that. Manager ratings. No, nothing too noteworthy there. Well, actually, John Todd. Way down in the manager rating. <laughs> I mean, it's, maybe it's because it's a French Grand Prix. And... None of his drivers are able to score points. I mean, it wasn't... Didn't Schumacher in real life win the French Grand Prix eight times? Eight times! Couldn't even come close to winning it. Couldn't even come close to scoring a point this series. But anyway, yeah, there's the, the British Grand Prix should play to our strengths massively. I mean, the hangar straight and the fact it's built in a former airport means power is quite important here. And we've got the Mercedes-Benz engine. We've got a power advantage over the rest of the field. And so we should run away with the British Grand Prix, which would be good because it's my home race. And as a manager, I've never won my home race. Would be good to see that happen for the first time, especially if Coulthard, that would be good actually, if Coulthard could win his home race. It's unlikely to happen unless Hackenham runs into some problems, but we'll have to see how it goes next time. So I'll see you then.